So the fifth and final series of these clips, I want to think a little bit about 1917 itself. Now, it should go without saying, as, as indeed it should for all of the clips that I've presented so far, that these are, much, these are summaries of enormously complicated historical events. Indeed, 10 to 15 minutes are not enough, but many, many hours would not be enough to contain all of the events that occur in 1917, a year of enormous complexity. Just to give you some of the brief highlights then in this clip, thinking in connection to some of those issues that I mentioned in the last clip on the war, it's the war of 1914-17. So on the 23rd of February 1917, International Women's Day, thousands of women textile workers and housewives took to the streets of Petrograd to protest at a bread shortage. Again here we have a, a food crisis and deprivation being really important to what occurs. This is an enormous demonstration, one that was largely spontaneous in character. In fact, it's the start of a political process that will lead to the abdication of the Tsar, which is something that not many people at the time had expected. By the following day, there were around 200,000 strikers taking symbolic control of the capital. Students and members of the middle classes joined the crowd soon after in late February, many of them bearing red flags and singing the Marseillaise. Among the banners were, were, the banners were emblazoned with words like, down with the war, down with the Tsarist government. Some of the other banners of February had demands to feed children or provide food to the family of soldiers. Soon afterwards, many thousands of soldiers joined the insurgents. There was great iconoclasm here, destroying emblems of slavery, the old regime, destroying things like the two-headed eagle, the symbol of the Romanov dynasty, and the arresting of Tsarist officials. The revolution, it seemed, was in progress, but it wasn't clear at this point where the revolution would lead. At this point, the Duma starts to take charge. Mem Liberal members of the Duma create a deputy, chaired by the Octoberist deputy, Mikhaila Radzianko, which plays a role in determining the course of events. This committee sets about arresting ministers, generals and police chiefs, and also persuading some of the regiment's commanders to side of the revolution. Radzianko uses influence to get the Stavka, the Russian high command in the military, on side in order to persuade the Tsar to abdicate. The February Revolution gave Turan in, gave to a short-lived mood of euphoria and national unity. Overnight, there were massive changes in political discourse. Far from being subjects, people were now considered citizens by many of the revolutionaries. In terms of the political settlement, it most famously gives rise to dual power. This is the creation of provisional government, a government headed by Prince George Lvov. The government on the 2nd of March pledged a programme of far-reaching civil and political rights and to convoke what they called a constituent assembly. Very important issues the government had to think about were the issues of war, which at this point was still ongoing, and also land for the people. On the other hand, the other part of this dual power is the Petrograd Soviet, an enormously important entity which controlled the army, transport and communications. Within a week, around 1,200 deputies were elected to the Petrograd Soviet, and the number soon rose to around 3,000. Significantly, Alexander Kerensky, who had played an important role in the events that year, was the only deputy from the Petrograd Soviet to join the government itself. The February Revolution produced a surge of patriotism and renewed determination against a wide chunk of society. In intriguingly, this was actually to defend a revolution against German militarism. So the question of war was still ongoing at this point, and the question of how to deal with uh, Russia's allies. Outside of the capital, the situation looked rather different. Indeed, dual power didn't really exist. Much as I mentioned in the last clip, Russia is an enormous entity, and a very complicated one in terms of its social, ethnic and religious and so on makeup. It wasn't always clear that people would be able to be keyed into these processes of dual power that are being made in the, in the uh, major cities. During the spring of 1917, many more Soviets sprang up. These played an important role in what was to come. The trade union movement, which had been suppressed, was revived. By October 1917, it boasted around 2 million members. And the appearance of the Soviets' workers' councils occurred exponentially throughout the year. 700 appeared during March and April, and by the summer they embraced around 200,000 deputies, an enormous number of people. The first All-Russian Congress of Soviets was at the beginning of June. Out of 822 voting delegates, 285 SRs, Socialist Revolutionaries, 248 were Mensheviks. 32 were Menshevik internationalists and 105 were Bolsheviks. So you can see then there's great disparity amongst the left of who is elected to these. In fact, in mid-1917, the largest of all the political parties in terms of their membership was indeed the SRs, the Socialist Revolutionary Party. However, they were, they were fraught with infighting and indeed split later in that year. <coughs> 
into left and right factions. Of course, at this point, it's very important to, to mention the impact of the Bolsheviks and, of course, Lenin himself, who would play a key role in the events that were to come. The war was still ongoing after February 1917, and frequent ministerial changes occurred in the official government throughout this year. Peasant land hunger was still an enormous problem, and many people in Russia were impatient. The provisional government had advanced plans for land reform and the convocation of constituent assembly, part of its wider desires to increase political representation. In the 3rd of April of 1917, Lenin returns after 16 years in exile. The left wing Menshevik Nikolai Sukhanov described his arrival at the Finland station in Petrograd, St. Petersburg, as, as follows He wore a round cap, his face looked frozen, and there was a magnificent bouquet in his hands. Lenin stood there as though nothing taking place had the slightest connection with him, looking about him, and then turning away from the executive committee delegation altogether, he made this reply Dear comrades, the piratical imperialist war is the beginning of the civil war throughout Europe. The hour is not far distant when the people will turn their arms against their own capitalist exploiters. The worldwide socialist revolution has already dawned. Now it's important at this point to stress that Bolshevism was much broader than just the views of its leader, and Lenin really only represents one particular strand, but it's important also to stress Lenin was the figure in the party even at this stage, and he stamped his views on it. He had enormous intellectual abilities, he had tremendous industry, he was extremely self-disciplined and confident, and in addition to all of that, he was incredibly intolerant of all sorts of political opponents. So Lenin's plans played a great role in what was to come. He sought an immediate end to what he called the imperialist war, and he called for an end to what he termed revolutionary defensism. On the 3rd of July 1917, something very famous happens, the so-called July Days. This is a very important part of 1917. Troops from the Kronstadt naval base and Bolshevik actives are fired upon by loyalist troops. This is an insurrection led by Lenin, which was also actually crossed by Kerensky, who orders, in his terms, severe retribution against those involved in the rising. After the insurrection is quashed, Lenin flees to Finland, and it looks as though Kerensky's won. If you were to teleport into this period in time, you might actually think the rise of the Bolsheviks and Lenin towards the end of that year is perhaps not foreordained at all. After the July days, Kerensky becomes Prime Minister. On the 19th of July, he appoints General L.G. Kornilov as Commander-in-Chief of the Russian Army. This is an appointment signed to save Russia from anarchy and to show Kerensky himself as a strong leader. But on the 26th of August, Kerensky lashes out after receiving an ultimatum, which asks that military and civil authority be placed in the hands of the Supreme Commander. This is something that becomes known as the Kornilov Affair. Kerensky accuses Kornilov of conspiring to overthrow the government. Kornilov is then relieved of his duties, but appears to ignore the commands and advances on Petrograd. This is something that's very controversial in the scholarship, and historians dispute whether Kornilov was conspiring to overthrow the government or not. Kerensky needed to call in the Soviets to stop Kornilov, showing at this point his, uh, his uh, reliance on the Soviets as important um, bodies in the country. We should also think about, I think at this time, the wider situation that's occurring. The key issues for the peasantry, the vast majority of people in the country, had remained the land question, but also the war. The food, food became an enormous problem. Many, much of the harvest was now being sold on the market. The government tried to, in, tried to respond by introducing a state monopoly on grain, but its attempts to force peasants to sell the grain at prices provoked them to conceal stocks or turn it into alcohol. An enormous food crisis was now looming, especially in Petrograd. Therefore, you have more widely in the country a real problem, uh, a real crisis brewing. But you've also got in in the in in the uh, in in the leadership itself, you've got great um, political political change, and also political valence is changing very very rapidly. The Bolsheviks proved quite adept at sloganeering people's popular concerns. The Bolsheviks were, worked very stubbornly and without let up to spread their ideas amongst the masses. This included in the factories and included amongst the peasants, but especially in the factory benches every day they worked, they worked ceaselessly.
The slogan, All Power to the Soviets, something very well known and associated with Lynn's April thesis, took an enormous uh, uh, cachet in this era, but its meaning was very ill-defined, and it's a slogan that belonged not only to the Bolsheviks, but also to the left socialist revolutionaries, anarchists, and also to a couple of the Menshevik internationalists. In the context of growing support for the Bolsheviks, Lenin concluded that internationally as well as nationally, the time had become ripe for them to seize power. He blitzed the Central Committee with demands that it prepare an insurrection, even threatening to resign when he suggests that history will not forgive us if this opportunity to take action is missed. Lenin then returns from Finland. Later on, in November, he persuades the Bolshevik Central Committee to commit to the overthrow of the provisional government. Lenin then, Lenin then becomes increasingly involved in political affairs and also becoming uh, very important in kind of changing the course of what's to come. On the 24th of October, military units of Red Guards take control of vital strategic points around Petrograd. On the 25th of October, one day later, Lenin appears in public for the first time since the July days to proclaim for the first time the provisional government had been overthrown. We should also be mindful that the Bolshevik party at this point did in, indeed include some disputes and bickering. Can Evan Zinovia for opposing Lenin's action? On 9th of October, we have the creation of a military revolutionary committee, the so-called MRC, to resist the transfer of power. On the 23rd to 24th of October, Kerensky moves against the Bolshevik printing press as a prelude to shutting down this MRC, which gives some of the other leading Bolsheviks, including Trotsky, the pretext to strike back. Kerensky then took steps to strengthen his forces. He ordered garrison units not to move without permission on the 23rd of October to only obey orders signed by the committee. When on the night of 23rd, 24th October, when the government shut down the Bolsheviks' printing press, Trotsky then declared action was imperative to prevent Kerensky crushing a revolution. And then on the 24th of October, the Red Guards took control of strategic points, bridges, railway stations and other key points. And unable to muster a military force that was credible in response, Kerensky fled. Lenin then emerges from hiding on the 25th of October, and on that same day, the Second Congress of Soviets opened. On the night of the 25th of October, the Winter Palace was, was stormed, and the Bolshevik government, and the provisional government, I should say, was arrested. The Second Congress of Soviets then opens on the 25th. About 300 out of 650 to 670 deputies were Bolsheviks, and so ratification and seizure of power to rely on support of the 80-25 left SRs. The Mensheviks and the SRs denounced the overthrow of the government's declaration of civil war and demonstratively walked out of this. Trotsky responds to his famous quip, go where you ought to be, into the dustbin of history. In Moscow, the Bolsheviks have made no preparations for the seizure of power, not setting up a military revolution committee, nor strengthening the factory-based Red Guards, their army. The command of the military district instead put up spirited opposition when Soviet powers declared on the 25th of October. The seizure of power is something that's really vexed and interested historians for many reasons, often presented as a conspiratorial coup against the democratic government. It is indeed noteworthy, though, that the government didn't really have too many supporters. Few military officers came to its aid, many despised Kerensky for what they saw as the betrayal of Kornilov, and the coup would not have taken place had it not been for Lenin and his consistent urging in the Bolshevik party to strike when the time was right. Thanks to the decision of the moderate socialists to postpone the Second Congress, his plans to present the latter with a fait accompli was achieved. But the insurrection and its execution was entirely the work of Trotsky. This was something that was actually disguised as a defensive operation to preserve the garrison and the Petrograd Soviet against what he called the counter-revolutionary machinations to the provisional government. Some historians have speculated to what extent the provisional government was already on its knees. Steve Smith, in his recent book, Empire and Crisis, suggests that in the provisional government expired even before the Bolsheviks had finished it off. An interesting conclusion there to think about when we think about the trajectories and the, uh, the uh, influences behind the seizure of power in October, November 1917. Now, I think at this point it's worth just stressing a few things quite quickly. By this point, of course, the Bolsheviks had taken, had taken power but it wasn't clear that the revolution itself had been achieved. In fact, actually, 1917, you might think, was in fact the, uh, a step rather than the, the final point on the revolutionary path in Russia. It's indeed followed by a very brutal civil war that goes on for several years. 
The Bolsheviks, unlike some of their rivals, sought an end to the war, but the peace that follows at Brest-Litovsk in 1918 was very, very punitive, and they inherited a country of enormous demographic problems. After 1917, we have population decrease as a result of the war and ongoing crises, famine, disease and starvation. Soviet power was established very quickly in the capitals, especially Petrograd, but it's a different story in the countryside where resistance goes on for some years. Peter Holquist, a very significant historian, is one of several who's considered the, the impact of the, of the violence and the death of this period. He, he calls it, in a very influential phrasing, an epoch of violence. During the Civil War, the Bolshevik Party starts to change exponentially. It expands hugely in terms of membership and in terms of state power. This is also the period in which the Cheka is established, the secret police, in December of 1917. Now, to talk in much more depth about the Civil War, I think would, in, would uh, make, mean I have to do another recording, simply because the Civil War is such an important and indeed complicated event. So what I'm going to do now is just kind of throw out there a few, a few questions to think about when you think about the revolution. Firstly, we might think about the views of Russian history. Was Russia moving towards a rule of law system for 1914, or was it becoming a police state? We might think about the trajectory in Russia in the longer term, thinking about some of those social changes I mentioned in the, pre in the preceding two clips. We might also think at this point about the War of 1914 and where this fits into all of it. Did the war in 1914 cause the revolution, or was social unrest coming anyway at some stage? We might think about the historiography, the historical writing too, and splitting historians and others into camps. Into, in some, some might see optimistic views of the old regime, thinking Tsarism had a potentiality to change. But we might also think of pessimists, people who thought the revolution was coming. It's just a question of when. These different views of Russian history and the interpretations that come are one of the reasons why the subject that I'm talking about today is such a rich and interesting one for us all to think about. There are, of course, many, many different writings on the, history, on the revolution that are extremely important. Uh, the centenary of the revolution occurred, of course, in 2017, only several years ago, and it unleashed a torrent of various historical writings, a slew of new books, and indeed other types of materials. Just to mention a few of those that have really informed this series of recordings, one of them is Steve A. Smith's recent book, Russia in Revolution and Empire in Crisis, 1890-1928. Other interpretations that, infor that have informed my own view very much are Sheila Fitzpatrick, The Russian Revolution, available in several editions, Rex A. Wade's book, Russian Revolution, available in several editions, and indeed, very recently too, Mark D. Steinberg's book, Russia, The Russian Revolution, 1905-1921. But there are many, many others I could indeed cite here that are extremely important. At this stage, I am indeed going to stop, and I hope you have enjoyed that little snippet of Russian history.